Okay, so we've now uh, developed the governing equations uh, for a generalized viscoelastic model. Now we want to talk about how we're going to use those to come up with things like creep compliance. Uh, and we're going to start talking a little bit more about how we're, uh, how we're going to actually uh, apply these models to the real world where, uh, you know, obviously we don't want to solve a, an nth order differential equation. Um, so how, how, what kind of solutions can we expect? So let's go ahead and, and address that and just let me begin by reminding you of stuff that we've already discussed. So let's say, recall, uh, we already showed the generalized uh, viscoelastic model uh, to have the following form. So recall the uh, generalized uh, viscoelastic model. I had the form that looked like uh, P times sigma is equal to Q times uh, epsilon. So let's call that equation one. Remind you what P and Q were. Okay, P and Q were differential operators. Okay, so differential operators. All right, and they had a uh, with. Um, polynomial Laplace transforms, okay? So polynomial LTs. Okay. Now, uh, let's also recall the creep compliance since that's the topic of this lecture. So how did we define creep compliance? Um, so recall creep compliance, which we defined as uh, j as a function of t, if you remember, so j as a function of t equals epsilon as a function of t divided by sigma naught. Okay, or uh, we said that uh, we could write that epsilon of t is equal to just sigma naught times the creep compliance j of t. Okay. Call that equation two, and that was that uh, was defined when what when what was the, what was applied when the applied stress history sigma t was equal to uh, some uh, stress sigma h applied instantaneously at time t, which we wrote as sigma naught times the heavy side function. Okay, let's call that equation three. Okay, um, now let's go ahead and try to solve. Uh, J for J of T. Okay, so try to solve uh, for J of T uh, using equation one. How are we going to do that? Okay, well we're going to set uh, sigma naught equal to one, uh, such that uh, that we could then write that sigma of t is just equal to the heavy side function h of t and epsilon of t then if if sigma naught is just one then epsilon of t just is the creep compliance j of t so we're going to collectively call those uh, equation four okay so let's go ahead and take the laplace transform of equation four so taking the laplace transform of four Right, then we end up with the sigma bar. If you look up in the table, the Laplace transform of the heavy side function is just one over s. So we just uh, call the Laplace transform of epsilon, uh, epsilon bar is equal to j bar. Let's collectively call that uh, equation five. Okay? So we're gonna substitute uh, five into the Laplace transform of equation one. So substitute equation five. Uh, into the Laplace transform of one, which looks like just P bar sigma bar is equal to uh, Q bar times epsilon bar, right? Uh, and that's, that, that's uh, let me just say what we assumed here. That's assuming that uh, sigma and epsilon and all their derivatives Okay, and all derivatives uh, vanish at t uh, is equal to zero as we approach it from the negative side. Okay, so in in that case, 
uh, we can then, uh, so if we just want to solve for um, epsilon bar, remember this now becomes j bar when I substitute equation 5 into there. I can write that um, what this looks like is p bar, uh, sigma bar is just 1 over s, so this is p bar over s is equal to q bar times j bar. Okay, we can solve for j bar uh, is equal to uh, p bar over s q bar, right? Call that equation 6. Well, that's simple, right? Uh, really easy. Uh, but how do we actually solve this for the general case? Uh, obviously, this isn't in a form that we're going to be able to readily use it for anything that we're going to uh, see experimentally or, or maybe use in our models. So how are we going to solve this? What I'm going to do uh, and what follows is I'm going to solve the case for n equals 3. Uh, there's three elements in this, um, in, a, in this generalized model. And I want to extend it to the case of the general case where we have n elements. And I think once we get to the solution, you'll see that that's easy to do, but it's not obvious um, until you actually see the solution. So just follow me uh, here, okay? So let's begin. Let's we'll say that we're gonna infer, so we're going to infer uh, the general solution, okay? Uh, by looking at the solution for n equals 3. Okay? At the solution uh, for n equals 3. Okay? And in this particular part 1 of the lecture, we're just going to get to the state where uh, we, we've, we are uh, at the end of Laplace transform space and ready to take the inverse Laplace transform to get back to the time domain. So we're going to get to the, the final solution in Laplace space uh, in this part 1. Okay, so here we go. Let's go ahead and consider a generalized kelvin voigt model. So consider a generalized kelvin voigt model. Right, and remember, uh, previously I said this was better for the stress history, right? And so we want it, we're going to use that because we're applying a, a stress. Uh, so this is better for a stress history. Okay. Uh, what's the governing equation? So I'm just going to remind you uh, the governing equation. If you don't remember this, uh, just go back. Go back to the, uh, the Kelvin, the generalized Kelvin Voigt uh, model lecture, but the governing equation uh, is as follows. It looks like Q naught times epsilon plus Q one times epsilon dot plus Q two times epsilon double dot plus Q three times epsilon triple dot uh, is equal to P naught times sigma plus um, P1 times sigma dot uh, plus P2 times sigma double dot. Okay, let's call that equation 7. Remember, this is for a three-element um, generalized Kelvin model. Okay, because we can divide equation 7 by any arbitrary constant without changing it, uh, we're actually free to select a, a reference. Um, we're going to just choose that reference to be P0 is equal to 1, okay? So just say that because uh, we can divide uh, 7 by a constant, we're free to choose a reference. right? And we're going to just set that reference by picking uh, one of our constants. We're going to choose uh, p naught to equal 1. Okay, so that then brings our our uh, governing equation looking like Q naught times epsilon plus Q one times epsilon dot plus Q two times epsilon double dot plus Q three epsilon triple dot plus oops is equal to uh, uh, sigma plus P1 sigma dot plus P2 sigma double dot. Okay, let's call that equation eight. Now let's go ahead and take the Laplace transform. Okay, so uh, taking 
uh, the Laplace transform uh, of 8, uh, we're left with, uh, I'm going to write this now back in our original form, uh, Q bar, which will be a function of S, times epsilon bar, will be equal to P bar, which is a function of S, times sigma bar, okay, where Q bar is going to be equal to, so this is this is just what differential uh, um, operator do we need on this left-hand side. Uh, it's going to look like, uh, let's see, Q naught uh, plus Q1 times S plus Q2 times S squared plus Q3 times S cubed. And then we can write um, P bar, uh, which is also a function of S, is going to look like um, 1 plus uh, P1 times S plus P2 times S. Let's collectively call these equations 9. Okay, substitute 9 into equation 6, which was just our definition of the, uh, um, the creep compliance. So substitute 9 uh, into 6. And we have that now j bar, which I'll just tell, remind you as a function of s, is equal to, remember we defined that as uh, p bar over s times q bar. So that looks like 1 plus uh, p1s plus p2s squared. Sorry, I should have had a squared there. Okay, divided by, um, see, so there's, a, there's s here, and then times q bar, which is q naught plus q1s plus q2s squared plus q3s cubed. Okay? Let me close the bracket there. Let's call that equation 10. All right. So there we have this, um, this polynomial fraction. Uh, we're going to consider this per term in the denominator in parentheses. Okay? Okay, so consider the, the term in the denominator, okay? And that, that term will be, let's say, Q0 plus Q1S plus Q2S squared plus Q3S cubed, okay? And we can write that, actually, as... Um, a factored polynomial, right? We could write that as we can pull out the Q3, factor that out, Q3. Then we can write this as uh, times S minus lambda 1, S minus lambda 2, and S minus lambda 3, right? Call that equation 11. Okay, and what, what can we say? Where... The lambda i terms, so where lambda i, are the appropriate polynomial roots of the equation, okay? Our appropriate polynomial roots. Okay? So all we did, do, all we did was factor that. So substituting 11 into 10, okay? So substituting 11 uh, into 10, we get the following. We can write that j bar as a function of s is equal to, I now have this, this q3 term, so I'm going to pull this whole thing out and say 1 over q3 times s, and then times this thing in here, which now looks like 1 plus p1s plus p2s squared divided by now my my uh, factored s minus lambda 1 s minus lambda 2 and then s minus lambda 3 okay there you have it let's go ahead and call that equation 12 Okay, what we're going to do from here is we're going to split that term uh, that's in the square brackets. We're going to split that into partial fractions, okay? So let's just say uh, split 
uh, the bracketed term into partial fractions. Okay. And I'm going to skip some algebra because it it's just uh, it's just messy, um, and it'd take you know twenty or thirty minutes to do right here. But 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 it's it's not uh, complex. It's just it's just straightforward algebra. Okay. So splitting into partial fractions. Okay. What can we write? We're going to say that um, uh, th this quantity one plus uh, p one s plus p two s squared divided by s minus lambda 1, s minus lambda 2, and s minus lambda 3, we're going to say that quantity is going to be equal to some constant a1 divided by s minus lambda 1 plus a2 divided by s minus lambda 2 plus a3 divided by s minus lambda 3. Now let me tell you the strategy here. So what you would do to solve for a1, a2, and a3 is you go ahead, take this form, you would then uh, find the common denominator, which would be this. You'd end up with a, a second order polynomial in the numerator, and you would set the powers of s equal to p, uh, p2, p1, or 1, depending on whatever the power of s is over here. And you would have three equations for your three unknowns, a1, a2, and a3. Okay, and uh, you would end up uh, being able to write. So if we if we if we uh, break it into partial fractions, what does it let us do? It lets us uh, uh, let me just say uh, where uh, you can show uh, just via algebra uh, that the following is true: that a1 is equal to uh, 1 plus uh, p1 lambda 1 plus um, uh, p2 lambda 1 squared divided by uh, lambda 1 minus lambda 2 times lambda 1 minus lambda 3. Okay, a2 is equal to 1 plus, you're going to see a pattern, uh, p1 times lambda 2 plus p1 times lambda 2 squared uh, divided by okay, lambda uh, 2 minus lambda 1 times lambda 2 minus lambda 3. And then a3 is going to be equal to 1 plus, uh, this is again, the pattern is clear, right? Uh, p2 lambda 3 squared uh, divided by uh, lambda 3 minus lambda 1 times uh, lambda 3 minus lambda 2. Okay? We can collectively call these equations. Let's call those equations 13. Okay, so if we do these partial fractions, <clears throat> if we if we uh, use these, then we can write um, that equation twelve. Okay, uh, can then be written as follows. Okay, and nothing surprising here. It's going to be written as j bar of s is going to be equal to this one over q three times s now times this quantity that we just showed that is a1 over s minus lambda 1 plus a2 over s minus lambda 2 plus a3 over s minus lambda 3, okay? And we'll call that uh, equation 14, okay? We're going to stop there for this this lecture, but this is the, this is the final uh, uh, solution for the creep compliance in Laplace transform space. And the reason that we've done it this way is because we now have it in a form where we can just look up the Laplace transform for this first term, the second term, and the third term, and just write it down. So that's going to be the topic of the next lecture, uh, the part two.